Hi guys and welcome to my review of every episode of The Simpsons and this time we are tackling season 8. Last time out, season 7 exceeded my expectations and at the end of the last video I said that I was looking forward to this one since the showrunners for season 7, Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein, stayed on for this one. Another thing I made note of last time was that the stories tended to be more character driven and down to earth. I am very interested to see if that is still the case this time because I don't remember it in that way if I'm honest. I always used to think of this season as kind of the gatekeeper between the classic era of the show and the not so classic era. I always used to consider it great but you could tell that the original premise of the show was starting to change focus a bit in that the plots were starting to get more wacky and the jokes were being put above realistic characters. Maybe I'm remembering that all wrong and I'll completely change my opinion after this rewatch. But I guess that is what we'll have to find out in this video. Before we get started, as ever, I'd like to thank the Simpsons Wiki for helping me out with the information here. And with that out of the way, let's get into ranking some episodes, shall we? Season 8, Episode 1, Treehouse of Horror 7. The three short stories this year are The Thing and I, The Genesis Tarp, and Citizen Kang. The trivia for this episode is that there was a punk band from Madison, Wisconsin named I Voted for Kodos, which of course takes its name from this episode. The best thing about this episode for me was just the election satire. The season premiere gets a 5 out of 5. Even though it is slightly odd for the season to start with a true house of horror, as it hadn't happened up until this point, it's still a great start to the season. The Hugo story was short and snappy, and though you may think the premise of it is a bit creepy, I found that the comedy stood out here. They managed to pack a lot of jokes into the few minutes, such as Dr. Hibbert with his mirror, the kids hiding in a closet instead of the jars, in that kind of schooly audience moment, and my favourite one about Homer spotting Hugo on a plane board into Switzerland, and he was really right there in the attic all along. Hugo himself may not have had much time in the spotlight, but he did become a bit of a famous character from the show, and he has been referenced many times in all kinds of Simpsons media. That helps to add a bit of a classic feel to this segment. Part 2 is an interesting one on paper. It is a bit fun to see Lisa creating a small world, and they do use the sibling rivalry with Bartwell in order to create a conflict for the story. That being said though, I found it to be lacking in jokes, especially in comparison to the first part. I'll on to that the fact that nothing really happens after Lisa gets shrunk and it just leaves me feeling a bit disappointed by the whole thing. I wish we got more to the ending to be honest. I wish we got to see what became of Lisa after Bart won the science fair project. Did he keep it? Did he flush it down the toilet as he promised? I don't know but we kind of got left hanging at the ending which is a bit of a shame. The third part, Citizen Kang however, easily makes up for it. It's a great statement and easily the best out of the three this year. Sure, basing it around the 96 election dates it but it dates it well. It is probably the best political satire the show's ever done, to be honest. And given it is election year, as I am making this video, it is as relevant as ever. Some of the points it makes are great, and the lines are just so concise and quotable. It does not matter which one of us you vote for, either way your planet is doomed. That line is great. And of course, the jabs it makes at the two-party system are so on point that it goes beyond being funny and kind of becomes a bit sad, if I'm honest. The response to, go ahead, throw your vote away. The someone wanting to vote third party is also exactly the kind of argument people make whenever voting third party is brought up. It really does feel like you could have two evil aliens as candidates and people would still vote down party lines. To go along with the great satire, there's also some funny moments here too, such as we are just exchanging long protein strands, and of course Homer's don't blame me, I voted for Kodos to end the episode. Overall, I would not say that this Treehouse of Horror special is as good as the last few in general, but the last part is what gets it to a fight. It is truly among the top tier of Treehouse of Horror segments for my money. Season 8, Episode 2 You Only Move Twice The Simpsons family moves to a new town after Homer receives a better job offer. However, Homer is oblivious to the fact that his new boss is a supervillain attempting to get world domination. The episode's title references the James Bond film You Only Live Twice. The best one for me was The Meeting Between the UN and Hank Scorpio. This one is an easy 5 out of 5. Hank Scorpio. That is a reason this is getting a 5. Need I say more? He really is just a riot whenever he is on screen. He has so much charisma and charm that it makes you wonder if he really is nice to the people who help him, or if it's all just a plot to get himself more power. I guess the credit really has to go to Albert Brooks for the performance he put in. It really does help make the character memorable. It's not just Hank himself though which makes this good, it is the way he gels with the other characters. Homer is a prime example. I love just how oblivious he is to Hank's supervillain shenanigans and how it is slowly revealed to the audience over time until the end where we see a full on firefight between Globex and the government. 
And it's so rare to see Homer as the straight man in these scenes that it automatically works in almost every way. In terms of the rest of the Simpsons family, I did not find their scenes as good, which is the reason why I would not call this my absolute all-time favourite episode of the show. I understand why those scenes are there. Bart, Lisa and Marge need to have a hard time to convince Homer to move back to Springfield. I just think that they are too dull and they're not really original either. Marge getting bored without housework and Bart struggling at school. They have been touched on before and nothing new is brought to the table here. Also, Lisa getting allergies to the wildlife kind of comes out of nowhere and is resolved just as quick. Again, I understand why these scenes are necessary to some extent, but I still think that they could have been executed better. What the episode does right though, it does so right that I still love it overall. I haven't even talked about the jokes on offer here yet. They have a very clever bent to them, like Homer and Hank walking on that escalator and Homer just interacting with the guys in the office. Then you have the more out there ones, like the Dallas Cowboys to the James Bond parody, to the hammock district, to the bridge blowing up, I mean I just could go on and on listening to them. It really is just so funny and the fact that Hank Scorpio is such a memorable character just adds to the episode's classic feel. Season 8, Episode 3, The Homer Lay Fall. Homer discovers that he has a genetic defect which allows him to take a lot of punishment to the head. As a result, Mo suggests a career in boxing and offers to become his manager. However, he soon lines up Homer to face the world heavyweight champ, Gredwick Tatum. The trivia I have here is that the chalkboard gag for this episode reads, I am not my long lost twin. This is one of the rare occasions which it references another episode, which is of course the Treehouse of Horror from the beginning of the season. The best moment for me was Dredwick Tatum's press conference slash parole hearing. So I think this one is a 5 out of 5. So the season continues its fine form here. I must say I thought about giving this a 4. It could have gone either way really. I just think that the boxing angle is done so well. It adds a sense of timelessness to the whole thing, which is what elevated it to me. The plot itself is of course over the top in that it has Homer fighting the Simpsons version of Mike Tyson. And some of Homer's abilities shown here do stretch believability a bit. The reason I think it works though is because it is entertaining. From the opening scene of Bart buying comic book guy's belt to seeing Homer rise through the ranks, there's always some kind of action going on which keeps me interested. This also translates to the jokes which I think were good overall. You have some great ones like the hungry young fighter fighting for a sandwich, as well as Homer's Hong Kong song for the big fight being why can't we be friends. But as I say, the scene with Tatum's press conference is the best of the episode. From him saying that he would reconsider pushing his mother down the stairs to wanting to make orphans out of Homer's children. The line, I imagine she would die of grief, regarding Marge, is something that I can imagine Prime Mike Tyson actually saying. It does help that I am a bit of a casual boxing fan, so I do understand the references that they put in the episode, but at the same time I'm not a full on hardcore fan, so I don't take it too seriously. As far as the parody goes, they managed to capture the feeling of big time boxing very well. Having Michael Buffer as a ring announcer helps, and the way in which Don King treats his fighters gets a well deserved jab here too. If you're not into the boxing side of things, you still have a bit of nice character stuff between Homer and Moe, which is worth a watch. The ending may be rather ridiculous, but it's still nice to see Moe give up the fame and money in order to save Homer. Season 8, Episode 4, Burns Baby Burns. Mr. Burns discovers that he has a long lost son, Larry. However, Larry's persona soon upsets Burns, resulting in him being kicked out. Homer decides to stage a kidnapping in an attempt to reignite Burns' love for his son. So in this episode we learn that Mr. Burns was a member of Yale's class of 1914. My best moment was the simulation of Homer getting shot by the police. This gets a 5 out of 5. I will say straight up that I'm giving this the max rating for the jokes more than the actual story. Sure Burns having a son is interesting, if a little unexpected, but you could tell that this was a one time deal which will never be brought up in a series again. So they at least tried to make the most of Larry given that he is a one time character. He is played very well by the late Rodney Dangerfield and has a lot of snappy one lines which are well delivered. The ending kind of sums the episode up really, it just kind of ends with a random party instead of any real conclusion, but at the end of the day what do we expect? It's not like Mr Burns is suddenly going to become very warm hearted towards his lazy son. What makes this episode for me is the fact that I just find it very funny. From the opening set piece at the Apple factory to all the shenanigans that come from Homer kidnapping Larry, I really just find it all to be so entertaining and actually quite well written. The plot may seem rather silly but the jokes are very clever and often fit into the situations quite well. Some examples are Kent Brockman's reaction to Homer and Larry leaving the house in broad daylight. There's only one word for that, idiocy. As I said, I also love the computer simulation on the news. I can't really analyse this one anymore. It's fairly simple and inconsequential in the long term but if you're just looking for some laughs then you can't go wrong with this episode. 
Season 8, Episode 5, Bart After Dark. Bart starts to work at Belle's burlesque house as punishment for breaking a stone gargoyle. However, Marge does not approve and sets out to bring the house down. Some trivia is that this episode's couch gag is a reference to Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The best moment for me is, we put the spring in Springfield. This is yet another 5 out of 5, but this episode deserves it. The idea of something like a burlesque house being in Springfield is actually very likely if you look at the town. So much so, I'm kind of surprised that the show has never done something like this before. It is interesting to see Bart put in this situation, and it allows for some good interactions between him and some other characters, namely Principal Skinner and Grandpa. Once Marge gets back from the boring trip with Lisa, it's obvious that she would have a problem with Bart working there, and one could argue that she is a bit nasty in the way that she organises the mob to tear the house down, but we have seen this kind of thing from her in the past, and she does get a comeuppance for it in the end. Again, there's not too much complexity to the plot, but it still manages to be fairly funny. My favourite joke of the whole episode is Grandpa walking in and then straight out of the house. It has become a bit of a meme online, and it's easy to see why. It can be applied to so many situations and still work. The only reason this episode is not an all-time classic for me is that it takes about 5 minutes to truly get going, and it did become a tad bit repetitive at times. Those are only minor nitpicks though, because I still love this episode, and the song here is iconic. It's probably one of the best songs in the show's history, for me anyway. It's not only very catchy, but also serves a big purpose in the narrative, coming nearly at the end. It is the thing this episode is still remembered most for, to this day, and for good reason. Season 8, Episode 6, A Millhouse Divided. Homer starts to question his own marriage when, at the Simpsons party, Luana Van Houten announces that she wants a divorce from Kirk. Some trivia is that originally, this episode had a subplot of Bart being jealous of Milhouse and wishing that Marge and Homer would also separate. Several scenes were written and animated for this episode involving that plot, but they were ultimately cut. The best moment for me was Kirk awkwardly singing Can I Borrow a Feeling. This one gets a 3 out of 5. So I found this to be a bit of a weird one. Half of it I liked, but the other half was dull and totally missed the mark. The idea of breaking up is good because it had been hinted at in the past that their relationship is not exactly healthy. I also think that it was handled pretty well. The back and forth passive aggressive comments between them was exactly how some couples act. I also like that they stay broke up at the end. It made the plot have some kind of lasting impact which is kind of rare for the show. Kirk Van Houten is the MVP here though. I always find his pathetic demeanour and sarcastic lines to be very funny. Even if it is unintentional on his part. He is where the best jokes come from here also. His terrible singing is great in how it progressively gets worse line by line. His pride in his race car bed is also good. And I love how Homer delivers a savage bird without even intending to do so. My favourite of all of them though is when he gets fired from his cracker job. Every line in that scene is better than the last. And uh, I don't recall saying good luck. Response to Kirk is just so perfect. As much as I like that side of things of the story though, I find that the Homer and Marge story kind of feels out of place if anything. I mean sure, it is fine for Homer to have some insecurities about his own marriage, but it kind of happens over nothing, and the fact that he files for divorce just to get a remarried makes little sense. It honestly feels like they just included it to be a bit of a shock moment, as it serves no other purpose. I have said in my previous season reviews that I feel like the Homer and Marge marriage crisis is overdone on the show, so the last thing I want to see is a subplot about it which is underdeveloped. It really is that side of things which hold this episode back, in my estimation. Season 8, Episode 7, Lisa's Date with Density. Lisa develops a crush on Nelson Muntz. She then sets out to change his personality for the better. Meanwhile, Homer obtains a telemarketing machine, which annoys the entire town. So this episode's title is a reference to the 1985 film Back to the Future, in which George McFly mixes up the words destiny and density. My best moment was Homer yelling at Ned and Maude to keep the noise down. 4 out of 5 I gave this one. I find this interesting more than particularly great or funny. It may seem odd at first that Lisa would have a crush on someone like Nelson, but the more you think about it, the more it isn't really. Lisa sees Nelson as this kind of free spirit and strong-willed guy, so it is understandable that she would be somewhat attracted to him. Also, as she says, she wants to try and change him and bring out the softer side of his personality. She does kind of succeed, at least for a short while, anyway, and the two have some surprisingly decent chemistry together considering their different interests. It probably was for the best though that they went their separate ways in the end, as Lisa would never be able to get rid of Nelson's more mischievous side. Smell you later indeed. I'm sure some people would have a field day with the whole girls preferring bad boys angle, and with Milhouse in the background of the whole thing, as a contrast, it does seem like this episode is making an understated point about that. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure there's a lot of truth to that narrative, but 
I don't want to read too much into it here because at the end of the day we're talking about kids and the type of love at that age is puppy love at best. I found the home auto dialer subplot to be a fun little diversion from the main story. It also brought up some much needed laughs which I felt the main plot was slightly lacking. I liked the Mr. Burns cutaway about being happier with the dollar than the eternal happiness as well as the whole sequence with Ned answering the phone in the middle of the night. It is just so Homer to shout at Ned to keep the noise down when the whole thing was his fault all along. Season 8, Episode 8, Hurricane Neddy. After a hurricane blows through Springfield and destroys Ned Flanders' home, Ned snaps at his friends and neighbours. He then checks himself into an asylum to discover the source of his sudden rage. The trivia is that Miss Potts, the babysitter bandit from Season 1, and Jay Sherman from The Critic are among the characters to make a cameo appearance in the cells at the insane asylum. The best moment for me was the famous scene of Ned breaking down at the town. This is an easy 5 out of 5 for me to give. I found this plot to be surprisingly well put together. I mean sure, Ned's house being destroyed by a hurricane is a very convenient way of kicking things off, but I don't really care because it uses that scenario to great effect. We get to see Ned pushed to his limit here, and he even has him questioning his faith. Now I totally understand why he would feel his faith to be honest, and when he finally does explode out the town, it's kind of justified really. Sure, it could be argued that they were trying to help out, but at the end of the day, they still built Ned's soap art for a house that was quite clearly not fit for purpose. Also, let's be honest, most of the points that Ned makes about the people of Springfield are true, even if they are a little harsh. The story does not just end Ned's development there though, we also get a nice look at his backstory, and his beak neck parents. It is interesting to see him try to confront his past, and the way in which he is cured through therapy, although kind of simple, kind of makes sense when you think about it. The only problem I have with the ending is that it is so abrupt and we don't really get to see what happens to his house. I mean I guess it must have got rebuilt somehow as it is there again next episode. Just talking up to bad continuity I guess. I do wish we got to see some kind of real conclusion with that though. That nitpick aside, I still really love this episode and the main reason why is I just find it hilarious. There are so many funny scenes. For example, I love how as Ned is looking about his new rebuilt house, it slowly goes from being somewhat competent to comically bad in a matter of seconds. At first it's just the odd loose nail, but then we see that literally the house shrinks as they go upstairs. The increasingly frustrated look on Ned's face sells that gag so well. I also love the jokes of Homer and Ned in therapy. The cards that Homer gets to read to him are hilarious, as is Homer proving how irritating he is by blowing gum in a professor's face. Overall, I consider this episode a classic for having both an interesting plot and being incredibly funny. Season 8, Episode 9 El Vadeje Misterioso del Nostro Homer The Mysterious Voyage of Homer After Homer eats a Guatemalan insanity pepper at the annual chili cook-off, his consciousness goes on a mystical journey to discover his soulmate. So, some trivia is that this episode was originally pitched by longtime writer George Mayer drawing season 3. The staff felt it was too odd for the show at the time, but Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein decided to use it. The best one for me was the chili festival. This gets a 4 out of 5. This was an unusual plot, of which I found the first half to be much better than the second. It starts off with a bang at the chili contest, which has pretty much all of my favourite jokes from the episode. You have Ned Fadders with his two alarm chili, Lenny's lied about I heard he carved it himself out of a bigger spoon, as well as my personal favourite line, it's not my job to talk people out of killing themselves, from Chief Wiggum, in response to Homer wanting to eat the insanity peppers. After the first act though, things quickly turn into the surreal and wacky with Homer's hallucination. I don't mind those scenes because there is some interesting imagery shown off and some flashy animation too. It is act 3 with Homer trying to find his soulmate that I found a bit mediocre though. It was not really funny in any way and let's face it, despite the misunderstanding that led to the fight, it was inevitable it would end up being Marge after all. The way she finds him at the lighthouse is a bit much and the whole ship crashing fell a bit flat for me. Not much else to say really, the first half is what gets the episode to a 4. The other half was forgettable in my opinion. Season 8, Episode 10, The Springfield Files Homer sees an alien in the woods near Springfield, but no one seems to believe him. Soon, FBI agents Mulder and Scully hear about the encounter and come to investigate the incident themselves. So, according to the DVD commentary, Hearding was originally supposed to keep the alien's identity a mystery. This would imply that Homer really did see an alien. I wonder why they changed it. The best bit for me was Homer encountering the alien for the first time. This rather unusual episode gets a... 5 out of 5. I must say, going into this one, I remembered it as being a bit of a far-fetched mess, which had little to offer besides being a random X-Files type mystery. So I was kind of blown away actually by how wrong I was. There was so much to offer here. 
some great jokes to snappy cutaways, and even some character moments between Homer, Bart and Marge. Things are so fast paced here, and there's so much going on that it kind of makes you forget about the main plot of the episode. I mean sure, Homer finds an alien which ends up through some ridiculous circumstances being Mr Burns. Normally I would be annoyed by how unrealistic that reveal is, but by that point in the episode I was already run over by the journey that I had just been taken on. The guest stars add to the feeling of fun, Mold and Scully do a good job playing their characters, and play into the whole mystery angle very well. Leonard Nimoy also has a great cameo for his second appearance on the show, after Marge vs the Monorail. I love how random it is, and how after wrapping it up early, he flees in his car and leaves a squeaky voice team to finish the bit. There really is just so much variety here, and the jokes are a prime example. You have the occasional observational ones, like Homer screaming at the billboard saying die, and even louder when it's revealed to be diet instead. Then you have the cutaways, like Mo inexplicably having a whale trapped in his back room. Then you have the references, like the alien lineup and Marvin the Martian being there. This makes me very angry. I have not even mentioned the atmosphere either. I love it when Homer first got lost in the woods with that orchestra that happens to be there on the bus. I could go on and on about why I like this episode, but surely by now I've convinced you. If not, then give it a watch for yourself and you'll find out just what a fun and unique experience it is. Season 8, Episode 11 The Twisted World of Marge Simpson After getting kicked out of her friend's business group, Marge invests in a pretzel franchise. But, when her new business starts to fail, Homer turns to the Mafia to help turn Marge's failing business around. So, some trivia here is that the episode's final scene, The Mob War, was conceived by Matt Groening, as no one else could come up with an ending. And Matt Groening did well there, because that was my favourite moment of the episode, the fight between the Mafias. This one gets a... 2 out of 5. I'm sorry, but I just found this to be a chore to sit through. It smacks of yet another occasion of the writers not knowing what to do with Marge. So instead, they retread old ground of having her falling out with friends. The idea of her buying a pretzel franchise doesn't sound very amusing on its face, and it's no better in practice. The entire first two acts I found to be slow paced and unengaging. I did not really care about the rivalry between Marge and Helen's group, so their constant back and forth attempts to destroy each other's business was just kind of meh. It did at least liven up a bit towards the end though, and all it took was Homer getting the Mafia involved. I just wish we actually got to see what that little guy's move was. That section also had the guy getting thrown through the window, then quickly asking the family for forgiveness. Now I'm sure there are some people out there who got more out of this than I did, but 90% of it was just boring to me I'm afraid. Season 8, Episode 12, Mountain of Madness. After the plant fails a routine fire drill, Mr Burns organises a retreat to promote teamwork. Employees are paired up and face a race to a cabin at the top of the mountain. The last one there gets fired. So the political powers that Mr Burns hallucinates seeing are Mao Zedong, Abraham Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Mahatma Gandhi and Ramses. The best one for me was the Smokey the Bear joke as you can see there. I gave her 5 out of 5. As a proper contrast to the last episode, I found this one to be pretty fun despite a rather wacky plot at times. The first scene of Burns setting up an impromptu fire drill sets the tone of what is to come. It's so over the top in how everyone acts, and Homer wedging the door shut on his way out is just a cherry on top. A mountain retreat to learn about teamwork does not sound like it is that crazy, but don't be fooled. They take it to some strange places. After Homer and Burns make it to the cabin first, through cheating of course, they have a brief period of bonding before they get trapped by multiple avalanches. I do like the tension between them in this part of the episode though, as they slowly become more mad with paranoia, and they turn on each other with their imaginary armies. And believe it or not, I've not even got into the craziest part of the episode either. Their problems are all solved in the end, when the propane tank explodes, and the cabin flies like a rocket to safety. So yeah, you do definitely need to give some license when it comes to the believability here. There are a few minor plots that run throughout the episode as well. We get to see a bit of Lenny and Carl working together, and also get the unusual pairing of Smithers with Bart and Lisa. There was also a scene of Marge at the centre, watching some kind of film, and I just did not get that joke at all. That kind of leads me into the main weakness of this episode, which was that there was a few dull scenes scattered throughout. All of the Marge scenes fall into this category, and the Smithers story never really goes anywhere either. The jokes overall are only average, but the standout is of course the Smokey the Bear one. I just love how clever it is, and how it could be applied to almost any situation. Season 8, Episode 13, Simpson Cali Fragilistic Expialidocious. So, some trivia relating to that title is that the episode's real title has annoyed Grant in the script in place of Doe. This is because that is how Doe, up until that point, was always written in scripts. 
it's not till later seasons that Doe actually appeared in titles instead of Annoyed Grant. And just right now, to avoid any confusion, whenever Annoyed Grant is in a title, I just refer to it as Doe because that's obviously what it's meant. The best moment for me was Sherry Bobbins getting hit by a plane at the end. Call me morbid if you want, but that's literally the only part of the episode I found somewhat funny. So as you might have guessed by that statement, I didn't particularly enjoy this one. As such, it gets a 2 out of 5. It was just not my cup of tea really. As a simple Mary Poppins parody, I found it was mostly boring and had a number of pointless, mundane songs. None of them really stands out as memorable in any way, and when you do a musical, you kind of need at least one of them to steal a show. The episode ends up taking some predictable paths. It was all too obvious that the Simpsons would revert back to normal and they would not really be changed in the end. It is a perfect example of how an outside character can never win on this show. It also seemed like they were trying to do some character stuff with Marge about how stressed she gets looking after the family. However, that storyline kind of gets abandoned in the end and she even says at the end that she's happy with the way things are, even with her hair falling out. That not only leaves me disappointed, it also seems to contradict the message that previous Marge episodes have had. In the past, the family have at least tried to ease the stress on her by cleaning up their act. The jokes also don't produce a desired number of laughs. Not even that many are attempted because so much of the time is taken up by the cheesy songs. Now I know there's probably some fans I've pissed off with this negative review but hey, I call it like I see it and I see this as a boring waste of time. Season 8 Episode 14 The Itchy and Scratchy and Poochy Show When Itchy and Scratchy's ratings start to fall, producers introduce a new character, Poochy. Homer is the one who wins the job to voice the dog. So the trivia I have for you here is that the episode features the first appearance of comic book guy's worst episode ever catchphrase. The best moment for me was Homer shutting down the hardcore fans in that autograph signing. This is a 5 out of 5 and it's fair to say that this episode was just dripping with satire. So much so that I can hardly recall any episode of any show I've watched to have done it to this extent. Seriously, at times it's like the writers were just talking directly to the audience or at least their perceived audience anyway. You have of course the famous scene with the nerd quizzing the actor about small mistakes in episodes, such as the so called magic xylophone, and of course the classic quote, boy I sure hope someone got fired for that blunder. As well as that, there's the on the nose exchange between Bart and comic book guy. I feel like that scene is slightly out of place, as Bart is making arguments as basically a stand in for the writers which is kind of odd, and the picking comic book guy as the type of straw man stand in for the entire fan base is obviously not correct. Sure, there are some entitled idiots out there, but that's not even close to the majority. But look, I do get that it was just some venting from some probable personal experiences the writers had had in real life around that time. And let's not forget that this was 1997. The internet was a very different place back then, so it's hard to criticise them too much. In fact, if anything, they deserve praise overall for just how well this episode has held up over the years. With the coming of social media, this episode has only got more relevant as time has gone on. It was not just the fan base that got called out here though. They made sure to jab at greedy corporations who prefer to latch on to the latest trend instead of being creative and thinking about real ways to change. Poochie, of course, fits this role well. And so does Roy, who is the ultimate meta character. It is nice to see Homer get the role of Poochie and how excited he is about it. But let's face it, he was kind of doomed from the start. The character was bland and despite Homer's impassioned attempts to save it, the powers that be decided to cut their losses and have Poochie die on the way back to his home planet. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Season 8, Episode 15, Homer's Phobia. The Simpsons family befriend a local shop owner, but after discovering he is gay, Homer starts to worry that Bart will emulate him. So this episode was almost banned from American TV, and it was only allowed to air after a change in Fox management. The best one for me was the gay steel mill scene. In the end, this one got a 4 out of 5. I was expecting a 5 for this, I must admit, and for the first two acts, it was very much on course for that rating. The plot did a good job of exploring the attitude that many people had towards gays at the time this episode was produced. After getting along with John well at first, Homer does develop what can only be described as a phobia to him after finding out that he is gay. In a way, it is kind of understandable that he would be confused by Bart's sudden change of behaviour after spending so much time with John, but he did not realise that Bart is just a kid and as such is very impressionable. There was a lot of funny lines and wisecracks between Homer and John which I found pretty funny and helped to keep a light hearted tone to things. And of course, Homer's failed attempts at showing Bart the wonders of being straight are hilarious. 
The final act is what drags this episode down slightly for me though. It felt a bit disjointed. I've been home with Bart, Mo, and Barney go on a hunting trip, which leads to them getting attacked by reindeers. It was a bit too random for me. Not to mention John saving Homer's life was a bit of a cheap way to get Homer to come around to him. It made John feel like a plot device instead of an actual character, which is a bit of a shame really. Despite that flaw though, this is still a good episode overall, a one which stood the test of time. It is kind of funny that how over time the public consensus shifted to being more tolerant of gays in general, which makes the whole premise here seem much less taboo than it was at the time. In a strange way though, I think it's kind of come full circle now. If this was produced today, and a character like Homer was being so ignorant and hateful to someone based only on their sexuality, you can just imagine how offended some people would be by it. Given the current council culture we live in, I would not be surprised if there were calls to have this episode removed from circulation or something stupid like that. Season 8, Episode 16, Brother from Another Series Bart is suspicious of Sideshow Bob after he is released from prison to reunite with his estranged brother, Cecil. Bob is simply in charge of supervising the building of Springfield's new hydroelectric dam. The favourite for me here is that the idea for this plot was from writer Ken Keeler. He had been watching a lot of Frasier episodes at the time and thought it would be a good idea to mix it with a Bob episode. The best moment for me was the ending. This gets a 5 out of 5. Now, the idea of Bob getting released from prison is hardly new, but at least this time they added a twist of him having a brother. Cecil is obviously meant as a nod to Frasier, and indeed the episode contains numerous references to it. That being said though, he does have a backstory of his own about how Bob took his dream role as Krusty's sidekick. It gives him a reason to resent Bob and it all leads to his grand plan of blowing up the dam. After all, it would not be the Sideshow Bob episode without at least a little bit of attempted murder now, would it? Other than that grand plan though, much of the time is spent diving into the dynamics between Bart and Sideshow Bob. Unsurprisingly, Bart is reluctant to trust Bob, and when they do actually work together in the end for the first time, it actually does feel a bit meaningful. This episode truly marked a change for the typical Bob dynamic on the show. Having him make up with Bart is an interesting choice that kind of leaves his character in limbo. It is no surprise that we don't get another Bob episode until season 12. The ending, as I said, well, kind of maybe a bit wacky, is still good. I just love how, even after reforming, Bob still ends up getting arrested thanks to an incompetent Chief Wiggum. He truly can't catch a break, can he? To go with that engaging story, there's plenty of funny stuff here too. I love the banter between Bob and Cecil. It provides some great one-liners, as well as a random joke about Rolf wetting his bed after being flooded out by the dam breaking. Season 8, Episode 17 My Sister, My Sitter Lisa gains a reputation as a good babysitter so it's a designer task of babysitting Bart and Maggie. Bart is humiliated by this and decides to make Lisa's job as difficult as possible. So this is actually the first appearance of the squid pod, which was inspired by many real life waterfront areas. The best moment for me was the scene at Dr. Nick's surgery. So a two out of five is what I gave this one. I really don't know what to make of this episode to be honest. It's rather a contentious one amongst the Simpsons community. Some people quite like it, and others consider it to be one of the worst of the classic era. I'll try my best to give my take on it. The first thing to note is that letting an 8 year old be a babysitter is a bad idea, plain and simple, and in some countries I'm pretty sure it's actually illegal. So the Springfieldians are frankly idiots for hiring Lisa as a babysitter, and Homer and Marge have to take most of the blame for what ends up happening to Bart. I mean Bart does have a history of tormenting his babysitters, so what did you think would happen when you put his youngest sister in charge? Bart's actions are understandable in a way, as most older brothers would not react particularly well to being babysat by a younger sibling. I do think that they took it a tad overboard though. I mean, Bart saying go to bread instead of go to bed is just more annoying than it is funny, and him banging his head against the wall until he passes out is just too dumb and out of character, even for him. And that right there is the biggest problem with this episode. Too many of the characters act out of character in order to go with the narrative. Bart and Marge are the two main examples of this, but it honestly applies to most of the town. There are some positives to the episode though. It is nice to see Lisa have that initial success as a babysitter. It shows that she is very mature, and after all, it's not her fault in the end what happens to Bart. It is simply down to the fact that the adults leave her with more responsibility than she can handle. The jokes were the best part about this for me though. I found quite a few of them funny. The Dr. Nick scenes are great of course. I love the line, you don't have to make up stories here, save that for court. 
I also found Homer's antics funny, from driving on the pier to getting stuck in the fountain. Overall, there was some entertainment here, which is why I don't hate this episode as much as some people do, but the plot was still too sloppy for me to like the episode overall. Season 8, Episode 18, Homer vs the 18th Amendment. When Prohibition hits Springfield, Homer goes into the booze making business with Bart's help. However, he soon comes to the attention of government official Rex Banner. Some trivia here is that Homer's nickname the Beer Baron is a reference to the New York mobster Dutch Schultz, who was known as the Beer Baron of the Bronx. My favourite moment was to alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. That famous quote by Homer. So did I like this episode as much as Homer liked alcohol? You bet. 5 out of 5 all the way. Yet another episode that has a very party type atmosphere. The focus is very much on fun throughout. The opening set piece of St. Patrick's Day not only contains a number of funny gags, it also sets the tone well. The idea that they pick a topic like Prohibition may seem odd at first, considering that, well, it's kind of been a non-issue for a century at this point. But I think it works, because they don't need to go deep down a rabbit hole of an issue. They are instead able to have more fun with the whole concept. They use this to great effect, and secondary characters like Moe and Chief Wiggum fit into this type of story perfectly. I love how eagerly everyone at Moe's is waiting for the next beer, and how comically inept Chief Wiggum is portrayed. As dumb as he is though, he might not even be the most inept officer in this episode. Indeed, the antagonist of the plot, Rex Banner, is portrayed as a total joke. On the surface he is a no-nonsense type of guy, but the episode goes out of its way to show that he does not really know what he's doing. The scene with Moe's disguise of the pet shop is great, as is the one-sided back and forth between Homer and Banner. The fact that he just cannot seem to figure out the obvious of who the beer baron is, is hilarious. Speaking of Homer, his wacky plan actually works this time, much to the surprise of Marge. She even encourages him and joins Homer and Bart in shutting down Lisa's concerns. Of course, things soon go back to normal, as Banner is catapulted away. That ending is very simple, but it also is on the nose, so it works pretty well. My favourite jokes from the episode include the shouting match between Homer and Banner, and of course, that classic line that is my favourite moment. Not only is that quote just so Homer, it also adds an element of truth to it bizarrely. Season 8, episode 19, Grade School Confidential. Some trivia is that the idea of Skinner and Krabappel becoming a couple had been around for years prior to this episode. When the idea was finally used, the writers took inspiration from the season 3 episode, Bart the Lover. The best moment for me was Krusty's sex cauldron joke. Another 5 out of 5 here for me. Skinner and Kabapu may not be like the tightest couple on paper in terms of their interests, but considering that they are two of the most prominent adult characters at the school, it was always likely for them to be put together. If you are going for a plot like this, the main thing is to make it believable, and this episode accomplishes that. There is not some kind of big moment that causes them to get together, rather they just board out a party and start talking. It all happens very naturally and doesn't come off as cliche in any way. Bringing in Bart as a complication to the story also succeeds in adding conflict. They were using him a bit, so it is no surprise that he ends up exposing them. Bart does make it up to them though by encouraging Skinner to stand up for himself and barricading them inside the school. This leads to some funny moments, such as the negotiation between Wiggum and Bart, as well as Homer asking about the remote. Let's not forget that sweet little dance that Skinner and Edna have too. It truly is a nice moment. I also like the ending. It is kind of awkward but funny at the same time, in just how everyone kind of quietly walks away after Skinner reveals the truth. The most important thing though is that they stay together at the end of the episode. Indeed, they continue to be a couple for a few seasons yet after this. It is nice to get both a happy ending for the couple, as well as a rare change of status quo for the show. Season 8, Episode 20, The K-9 Mutiny. Bart buys an expensive dog purchased on a fake credit card. When creditors turn up to take the dog back, Bart ends up giving them Santa's little helper instead. So, the trivia is that the song played at the party during the end credits is Jammin' by Bob Marley. The best one for me was, There, there, shut up, boy. That quote by Homer. This one is a 3 out of 5. This is a classic case of solid but not spectacular. It is interesting in the first act to see what kind of crazy stuff Bart buys with a fake credit card. And of course, a super dog is at the top of that list. I have always found it kind of weird how easily Bart gives Santa's little helper away though. They usually have a stronger bond than that on a show. I know it had to happen for the plot to work, but still, he only just got laddie after all. So it seems kind of a mean-spirited thing to do. It helps that Sanders' little helper is oblivious to the whole thing though. Also, Bart does make up for this in the end by regretting his actions and getting Sanders' little helper back. 
It's not entirely convincing how it happens though, but oh well. At least it gives the cops the chance to party with the blind man's drugs, I guess. I do have to say though, Laddie was pretty cool for the short time he had, and the interactions he had with the townspeople at the park made it all worthwhile. The jokes are kind of like this episode really, pretty average. All the best ones come from Homer, even though he doesn't get much screen time. You have that one I mentioned, the rant he goes on about eating dog food, and his line, you have to feed a dog like that every day, as a response to seeing Laddie for the first time. Season 8, episode 21, the old man and the Lisa. After Mr Burns loses his vast fortune, he turns to Lisa for help in getting it back. However, she only agrees to help him if he does it through environmentally friendly means. So a fun fact is that professional wrestler Bret Hart, who guest stars in this episode as himself, insisted that he was animated wearing his pink wrestling outfit. The best moment in my opinion was Mr Burns' speech on how to succeed in business. This was a bit of a tough rating to give but it got a 4 out of 5 in the end. The old man and the Lisa is a very apt title for this one because Burns really does feel like an old man here. I mean, we have seen him a bit senile before, but this is the most extreme example of it yet. He has no idea he's going broke, and has not checked the stocks since 1929. He can't even go to the supermarket by himself for crying out loud. Usually, when Burns is shown to be out of touch, he's with either Smithers or Homer, who do things for him. But here, he's just left to fend for himself, as Smithers is still working at the plant. That is until he joins forces with Lisa, which may be an odd pairing on paper, but it was inevitable that Burns would have a story with every Simpsons family member at some point. I think they do a decent job at showing the contrast between Burns and Lisa, and they even try to fool you into thinking that Burns has really changed. Of course he didn't though, and things go back to the way they were. Lisa declining the money at the end is frankly an odd decision. I mean, wouldn't you rather the money be in your pocket rather than Burns? At least you can do some good things for the money, but if you let Burns keep it, he's just going to continue to do environmentally damaging things. It doesn't make much sense. It is of course done to have the gag of Homer suffering multiple heart attacks. I can let it slide because I did find that gag quite funny. But did Lisa really have to tell him that it was 12 million she turned down instead of the 12,000 though? Overall, what helps this episode be more enjoyable to me than it otherwise would be is the jokes. I found this fairly funny, early doors especially. Burns' rant about business and mother nature is great. As is his response of, is there any real questions to the cheesy question that Skinner asks? I also laugh at Skinner reversing into a tree, right after Lisa said that they had recycled enough to save one tree. Season 8, episode 22. In Marge, we trust. Marge volunteers as an over-the-phone counsellor for a church, and she soon becomes more popular than Reverend Lovejoy. Meanwhile, Homer goes on a quest to find out why his likeness is used as the logo of a Japanese detergent company. So, some trivia is that the writers, to help create the advertisement, watched many videos of Japanese commercials to get a feel for how they worked. And I think that research paid off because the best one for me was the Mr. Sparkle commercial. I give this one a 4 out of 5. This is not a classic or anything, but I still found it pretty enjoyable. The main plot is fine for what it is. It's good to see both Marge and Reverend Lovejoy get a starring role. We finally get to see firsthand how the Reverend lost his passion for the job. And to be honest, with Ned pestering him all the time over the mildest things, you could hardly blame him. Marge is a nice contrast to him here as well, because she is a caring person at heart, and unsurprisingly does well as the listen lady. Seeing this makes it clear just how far Reverend Lovejoy has fallen, and to be fair to him, he does try to make up for it in the end. That ending at the zoo with the monkeys is a bit random. It does add some stakes to the plot, I guess, but it's still a bit too silly for me to take it that seriously. It does at least lead to the funny scene of Reverend Lovejoy bragging about the encounter in his sternum. The subplot is just as good as the main though, if not even better. Mr. Sparkle is quite memorable, and it's nice to see the brief journey that Homer goes on to find out why his likeness is on a Japanese product. Most of the jokes come from this plot too, such as Homer making the long distance call from the library and staring at the box at the dinner table. There is even a nice little callback at the zoo with some Japanese tourists wanting a picture with Homer. As I mentioned, I like the commercial. It's just pretty flashy and the revelation it was just two random logos put together is a simple and fun way to wrap things up. Season 8, episode 23, Homer's Enemy. Frank Grimes, the new employee at the power plant, gets annoyed by Homer's incompetence and laziness. He soon ends up declaring himself an enemy of Homer. So some trivia is that this is actually the highest rated Simpsons episode on IMDB, with a 9.3 out of 10 rating. The best one for me was the Frank Grimes meltdown. Hank Azaria really does perform that so well. 
In fact, his whole performance as Grimes in this episode is probably one of the best in the whole show. He really does go through a range of emotions here, and he sells it all so well, so credit to him for his performance here. This one is indeed a 5 out of 5. Homer's Enemy is obviously one of the most well-known and talked about episodes of the show, and for good reason. Right from the opening scene on Kent's people, Grimes is shown to be a hard-working guy who has been unlucky in life to a ridiculous extreme. I mean, a silo literally blows up next to him for no reason for God's sake. Once he gets brought to the plant by Burns and starts to interact with Homer, the cracks begin to show straight away. Grimes in this episode is portrayed in a very human way. By that, I mean he has some relatable problems and does try to do his best, but he's also a very bitter and jealous person. Now, given the life he has had, that is not really surprising, and I'm certainly not saying this to make Grimey out to be the villain of the piece, just simply to highlight that there is a grey area in terms of his character. Again, he is a flawed person, but he's flawed in very human ways. Contrast that with not only Homer, but also Lenny, Carl, and the rest of the town, and you see why he is doomed from the start. They are all in their own little cartoon world, quite literally. And that is the world where Homer can keep his job despite causing meltdowns and win a children's contest with a clearly inferior design. Not only does he get away with it, he's actually rewarded and praised for it. It is like the writers were asking us if someone like Homer could exist in real life. Most of us probably know people who seem to get by in life despite being lazy and incompetent, even if not necessarily quite to the extreme of Homer. But the key is to just get on with it and not drive yourself insane by comparing yourself to other people. The plot finishes with Grimey's death, of course, and while it is a dark ending for sure, it is kind of not surprising from a character who tried to tackle cartoon logic from a real-world perspective. The humour in this episode is also rather good. Bart, owning his own factory, not only connects with the main plot, it was also fun in its own right. My favourite jokes on the episode were Frank Grimes learning to feel pain again after his accident, and Homer reversing into Grimes' car as he was trying to have his evil moment. In the end, this is a classic episode. It tackles the whole dynamic of the show in a different way and manages to be funny at the same time. Season 8, Episode 24, The Simpsons Spin-Off Showcase. Troy McClure presents three Simpsons spin-off spoofs. They are Chief Wiggum, P.I., The Love Matic Grandpa, and The Simpsons Family Smile Time Variety Hour. So, the tiny alien called Osmodiar is of course based on the Great Gazoo from the Flintstones. The best moment for me was Jasper Beardley singing Lollipop. This one gets a 2 out of 5. I did not like this episode at all. It was boring for the most part and none of the stories in it were particularly compelling. It also had a bit of a clip show vibe to it for some reason, even though it was obviously not a clip show. It just kind of felt that way to me. If I had to pick a favourite segment, I would go for the Mo love story, because at least it had some decent banter between Mo and Grandpa. The rest of it was just bland. And I understand that the point of it was to be kind of bad in a cheesy type of way, but whether that was the intention or not, it does not make it any less of a chore to sit through. I have nothing else to comment on really regarding the content of the episode. I do at least admire the showrunners and writers for trying something different, as I always do, but this one didn't turn out to be one of their best efforts. Season 8, Episode 25, The Secret War of Lisa Simpson. Lisa is determined to succeed as the only girl at the academy when she and Bart attend military school. So the trivia for this season finale is that originally there was a script written in the first three years of the show in which Bart was sent to military school. However, at the time, the story did not work, so it was thrown out. The best moment for me was Bart's megaphone testing. The last one of the season gets a 3 out of 5. Now, I know I'm not the first one to say this, but it really does seem like a poor man summer of 4 foot 2. They are both Lisa stories about fitting in with Bart learning to be supportive along the way. They also happen to be the season finale of 7 and 8 respectively. The reason this one isn't as good as that one is down to two main reasons. One, unlike other Lisa stories, this one feels a tad forced. I mean, they established that Lisa could leave at any time, so I frankly don't buy the idea of her wanting to stay. Also, the boys at the academy are mean to her, no doubt, but the episode keeps hammering this point home when it really didn't need to. In the end, it comes off as a Lisa sympathy exercise instead of any actual authentic character growth. The only one you could argue does get a decent conclusion to his arc in the episode is Bart. After being forced to stay at the place, he does knuckle down and complete the training. He also finally does do the right thing, in the end, by standing up for Lisa against the peer pressure of the boys. Although, even this dynamic, I feel, has been done better in previous episodes. The other main reason this one isn't as good is that it simply isn't as fun. We get some okay moments early on alright, like Bart with the megaphones of course, and the films in the school, 
but once the kids get to the academy, the humour dries up completely. Instead, we are treated to melodramatic stuff that tries to get me to care about Lisa's plight, but is so over the top that it actually makes me care less. The ending is a prime example of this type of drama for drama's sake. I mean, the big obstacle that Lisa has to overcome is literally a big rope with a load of fawns at the bottom. I mean, it does not get any less subtle than that, does it really? Now, I know for a fact that there are some people who love this episode, especially if they are big time Lisa fans, but to me, while it had some okay moments, it was still disappointing overall. So, we have now finished season 8, and we move to the summary of that season. Once I averaged out the episode's score, the overall average for this season was 4.08. In terms of my top 5 favourite episodes, You Only Move Twice was my favourite, Homer's Enemy was my second, The Itching Scratchy and Poochie Show was third, Hurricane Neddy was fourth, and Mountain of Madness was fifth. And for the first time since season 2, we have the return of the bottom 5. This time I felt that there was enough episodes that were kind of lacklustre for me to justify including it. My least favourite of the season was The Simpsons Spin-Off Showcase, The Twisted World of Marge Simpson was my second worst, Simpsons Califragilistic Expialidocious was the third worst, My Sister My Sitter was the fourth, and in at five with kind of the arbitrary one on this list, The Secret War of Lisa Simpson. That episode really wasn't that bad, it's just that I had to fill up this list and I found it to be the fifth worst of the season. At the start of this video I said I wanted to compare how this season went about things compared to the last. That is because season 7 was more character driven, with only a few changes of the format sprinkled in, like 22 short films for example. This season, despite having the same showrunners and pretty much unchanged staff, was wildly different. It is almost like they went out of their way to try something new and tweak what worked about the previous season. Rather appropriately for the time, this season really has a mid to late 90s feel to it. The focus was very much on having a good time as is shown by the numerous episodes which end with a sudden party out of nowhere where the whole town gets involved. This type of laid back attitude naturally allowed the writers to be much more meta about how the characters and even the entire show work. The obvious examples of this are the Itchy and Scratchy and Poochie show and Home's Enemy in which you really have to think about how this show works from a real world perspective. Given that those episodes are my second and third favourites it kind of goes without saying that I think they handled that meta look at the show very well. When they do touch on character relationships, it tends to be more awkward here, and they don't quite succeed to the level of the previous year. There is some good stuff here, like Grade School Confidential and Hurricane Neddy, which expand on side characters, but for every good episode like that, you have A Secret War of Lisa Simpson and My Sister My Sitter, which don't quite click for me at all. This is why, although I still love this season, and I do consider it a part of the classic era, it is still the most inconsistent of that era, and you could tell that the wacky high concept plots were starting to become more and more regular. Now that is not necessarily a bad thing by itself, but unless you are careful it can lead to some lackluster character writing and inconsistent episodes. I am interested to see how that angle will develop into season 9 and beyond. My current opinion is that season 9 was a good season but had a notable dip in quality from the classic era. I haven't seen that season in a number of years though, so you will have to join me next time to see if I stand by that opinion or not. Anyway, that is all for this video guys. Thanks for watching, I do appreciate it, and as always, take care.